started. Um, thank you for joining us this evening, and I want to take the opportunity to thank the university for inviting me here tonight to be part of the inauguration ceremonies for Dr. Julie Wollman as the 17th president of Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania. Thank you for having me, um, and, and I'm very delighted to be here tonight. So I wanted to start off the panel with a quote, and I don't want to screw it up, so I'm going to look, but it's a quote by a gentleman by the name of Henry Mintzberg, who's a Canadian author on business and management. So for those of you who didn't know who he was like I didn't, I, I quickly Googled him. Uh, but the quote is, leadership like swimming cannot be learned by reading about it. And I thought it was very fitting for the panel tonight as we talk to your fellow students and some of your professors about how they're learning about leadership. And it's by doing it. You're going to hear about things like work experiences, whether they're on campus or off campus, leading projects, research projects. And they're going to talk to you about how they apply those learnings to leadership and how it can help them in the future as well. You'll also hear from the professors about how they help to teach that leadership and how they help the, the students to apply it to what they can do in the future as well. So we have representatives from the psychology department, from communications, and from educational leadership. And they are, like I said before, the students will talk to you about what leadership means to them, how they've gained leadership experience, and the faculty is going to talk to you about how to develop those skills and what you can do as students to help develop those skills as well. So with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to the panel. We'll start at the end, please, and we're going to go through a quick introduction of our panelists. I'm Cynthia Lagan Bussell, and I'm chair of the psychology department. I'm also a professor um, in psychology and um, have a lot of responsibility here. And I think one of the jobs as the chair of the psych department is to facilitate learning and in so doing facilitate leadership. And to my left is Mr. Shane Goller. Uh, my name is Shane Goller. I am a psychology major with minors in chemistry and biology. I am also the Cadet Battalion Commander of the ROTC Department at Edinburgh University. Uh, I'm the President of the International Psychology Honor Society, the Treasurer for the Biology Honor Society, um, and I'm also the Financial Advisor for ROTC. Uh, I've been in the military for five years and utilize that whenever uh, I'm working in leadership roles on campus. And I've also been a volunteer at St. Vincent Health Systems in Erie, Pennsylvania for the past two years. My name is Jim Wirtz. I teach broadcast journalism in the Department of Communication and Media Studies. Uh, in addition to my teaching uh, roles, I also advise ETV, the campus's student-run television station. I am Anthony Lopinto. I am a senior majoring in broadcast journalism with a minor in psychology. I was previously both the sports editor and editor-in-chief of The Spectator, our campus newspaper, and currently I am the general manager of ETV. Good evening, Andy Pushchak. I'm the Director of Educational Leadership, which is a graduate program that has a master's degree of educational leadership, and we run certification programs for principals, supervisors of special education, and superintendents. And um, through being the director of the program, I get to work with all of the students in the program. In addition to the coursework, I also supervise their internships. So I'm able to see um, the students putting their theory into practice. And um, we're very, very proud of one of our students that's with us tonight, and that's Lori Kantz. Hello, I'm Lori Kantz. I'm the assistant principal at Segertown High School. I also work with the elementary school um, in the Segertown attendance area one day a week. Um, a lot of my responsibilities center, center around student discipline, but I also um, am in charge of our SAP program. That's a student assistance program, our Olvaeus Bully Prevention Program. Um, we have um, a lot of different things that we're working on with our teachers right now, trying to move them forward. We're working on PLCs, which is professional learning communities, so we're doing a lot of teacher training with that and trying to build um, leadership capacity for the staff and for our students as well. Okay. Thank you, and again, thank you all for being here and participating. We're to the point now where I'm really going to turn it over to the panelists as to what they're going to discuss, but I'll direct some of the questions, and, and I'm just going to go down the line. So Shane, you're the lucky winner on this one, but I'd like you to take a few minutes and just provide what do you define as student leadership, and what is your perspective around what does student leadership mean to you? Okay. Um, well, I guess I'll start off with uh, the dictionary definition of leadership, which is just an individual who guides or directs a group. 
Uh, I think that leadership is a lot more than that. I think leadership is actually somebody who provides mentorship and guidance to help individuals learn to guide themselves. Uh, leadership to me is the ability to take and mentor a group of individuals to make them better than what you are, than what they started out as. Um, this can be seen through various facets such as ROTC. Uh, as of right now, I'm the cadet battalion commander of the ROTC department. We get freshmen coming in directly out of high school, and it's important to to take leadership and teach them to provide leadership for others. So what we do is we have mentorship programs that we utilize here at Edinburgh University to get them on the right path with grades, uh, military, and organizations on campus. Um, my, my first leadership experiences began whenever I was 17 years old. Uh, that's when I enlisted in the Pennsylvania Army National Guard as an infantryman. Um, and, and through my service with the Army National Guard, uh, I learned a lot about camaraderie, about leadership, motivation, and things of that nature. And that, that was still when I was a, a senior in high school. Uh, upon graduation, I decided to become a psychology major here at Edinburgh University to learn more about individuals and what motivates and drives them so that I could help develop my own leadership style to become tailored to understanding the individual. Um, upon entering Edinburgh University, Upon entering Edinburgh University, I uh, was recruited by Dr. Jeremy Sedaris, who uh, was my English 101 professor and also the director of the Writing Center, which helped to, and I became a volunteer at the Writing Center, which helped to uh, develop my leadership a little bit more. Um, I learned a lot about one-on-one -on -one counseling and one-on-one -on -one guidance with individuals to help them not only improve themselves, but to improve your leadership style. Um, and, uh, Perfect. Yeah. So what specifically about your experience in the ROTC do you feel you'll be able to apply to the future now that you're, you're almost there, you're approaching the time when you're going to join us in the workforce? So what have you learned about leadership that you think you'll really be able to apply in your future? I think the main thing that I learned from ROTC was development and something that we call in the military leading by example. Um, I always take and develop my subordinate leaders as well to take the initiative. You can't expect somebody that works underneath you to accomplish a task that you yourself are not willing to do or have not already done. So I think that leading from the front is, is what we call it in the military. Um, and, and it's important to always take the initiative in, in every task that you do. In order to run an effective organization, you have to be willing to put, put time in, motivation in, and that's how you get the best result possible. And uh, I, I didn't say this during my biography, but I'll be attending medical school in fall of 2013. And I hope to utilize that uh, further knowledge that I gained from that mixed with my active duty military experience and attempt to not only improve myself educationally, but to also provide the best training that I can for those that will work underneath me in the future. Great. I'm going to skip down to Anthony. Uh, same, same topic, but really, why are you on this panel tonight? What about you says, I'm a student leader, and what are some of the experiences that you've had from a leadership perspective? Okay. Well, just to kind of pick up where Shane was going with the definition of leadership, to me, I think that's something that has consistently changed as I've been expo exposed to different leadership roles. Uh, in high school, I think leadership positions were kind of more of an honorary thing. You know, to start all the way back there when I got my first opportunities to be a, a leader of my peers. I was, uh, I was on the executive panel for a National Honor Society, which really just, I, I gave a speech. You know, there's not a whole lot of leadership for that, but another thing I did in high school is I was in marching band my whole four years. And that was something where whenever you're a young student in marching band, say you're a freshman coming in, you were placed into a specific squad, which was different students who are above you, some upperclassmen who are going to help you to ease that transition, who are not going, so it wasn't necessarily going to be a band director who's going to be leading you through all the different things you were doing while you were on the field or learning the music or learning the steps and those kind of things. It was really the students leading the students. So that was really my first kind of experience to learn how to have that really delicate balance between being both a friend to someone and being a leader to them as well. So I was exposed to that from the beginning of high school. I eventually ascended to being the vice president of, of marching band in, in my high school and I was also a squad leader. So it was, you know, by the end of my time in high school I was used to leading my peers in a way that could 
could motivate them in one hand, but on the other hand, to not sever any kind of relationships or seem like you were being above them in any way. Uh, upon entering school at Edinburgh, I made the unfortunate decision to not get involved right away. Particularly, you know, being in journalism, it's, it's a grave mistake. And anytime I've gotten an opportunity to talk to young students from then on out, I've said, you, need, you guys, you need to get involved right away because it's extremely important. I was lucky enough to do enough good work within my classes to be recruited by Konstantin Fekos, who was the news editor at The Spectator at that time. And I was, so this was the spring of my freshman year, was the first time that I got an opportunity to work with The Spectator. And I was really eager to get involved because I knew it was an opportunity that fell into my lap that I really needed to take advantage of. So I worked really hard for Constantine. I would offer to do so many stories a week. And Constantine was really short on writers, so he appreciated those efforts that I had from him. He anointed me his golden child, which didn't always go over so well with the rest of the organization, particularly because I was just a freshman. But I worked hard and I proved myself to him. So within, after a first month of, at the end of that first month of writing for The Spectator, Constantine told me to apply to be for an editor's position for the next year, which would have been the beginning of my sophomore year. So I really didn't think I had a shot at that point because I was so new to it, but I, I had proven myself enough to Constantine to, to let him know that he saw those qualities in me. So I applied to be the sports editor of The Spectator, and I, and I got that position. So whenever I was the sports editor, I was finally in charge of leading a team of writers to planning a section out every week, to editing stories, to developing my writers in a way that could help make them better and to help make our product overall better, and also to fit into a team of equal leaders. Because on something like The Spectator, where there were several paid editors' positions, you have to fit into kind of that framework that already exists and to, to be in charge of your own thing, but also to work collectively to that greater goal. So I was able to observe Constantine through that because he had become the editor-in-chief for that year. So I was able to see and pick up on the kind of things that Constantine was doing. And as the end of the year was approaching, we still didn't have an editor-in-chief for the following year because Constantine would be graduating. So he approached me and kind of began grooming me for that position. And at first, I didn't think I could do it because I, didn't, I saw that Constantine literally almost slept at the office most nights. He was there all the time. I knew how, what kind of a time commitment it was. And with my focus being on broadcast as a specialization rather than print, I didn't know if it was something that I should do. But I thankfully did it. And it was an extremely difficult year in a lot of ways because I wasn't used to having that kind of pressure and responsibility. It was nothing that I had ever experienced before because while I was used to the journalism side of it from being a sports editor, there were suddenly all of these different pressures that I had never realized came along with being a leader before. There were, I was dealing with the administration, the president and people of that nature. I was dealing with SGA and the pressures that come with that. And I was dealing with the heads of my department. So everyone has their own expectations for what you should be doing. And not in a pressuring way, but just in a way that people expect a certain quality of your work and they expect a certain kind of work out of you. So I, I was dealing with that. And then within my own staff, I had never realized how much even one personality conflict with someone in your staff could potentially undermine everything you were trying to do. So it was a constant game of adjustment to work with people individually to try to foster the best kind of leadership within them because you know I'm also leading a team of leaders with, within those individual editors. So it was, a, a, it was a game to get the best out of everyone. And I was able to have successes and failures, but to learn from both of those and to apply that now to my position with ETV and you know my, my degree and my definition of leadership is continually changing. But for me, I think the most important thing to remember, especially in this context, whenever we're all students here and we're all kind of on the same page and learning, is to be inclusive. As a leader, I never wanted to be like a dictator and stand up and preach and assign things to people. So I always wanted everyone to feel like they had an equal voice in what they were doing. And I find that that works really well because it kind of fosters a kind of a, a community involvement within everyone. It's kind of like a family more than it is an organization. We're all very close and we get along very well. And I think for me, that's the most effective style of leadership is to just make sure that everyone knows that they have a role in what's happening. Sounds like a lot of great experiences and things that you can take with you in the future. Absolutely. Good. Last but not least, I'll, I'll go to Lori. It sounds like you're very much in a leadership position right now um, in a school environment, which can be a tough environment. But why don't you walk us through the decisions that led you to where you are now and some of the learnings that you've had in those experiences? OK, well, I graduated from Edinburgh University with a degree in um, elementary ed and early childhood back in um, 1995, and always had a passion and a love for um, teaching kids and, and wanting them to be successful. Um, 
I went straight to Pencrest School District and subbed there and then had a permanent position um, within a couple of years and taught first and second grade classes for about 13 years. Um, loved teaching, loved the students, and you know, along the way we had changes in uh, procedures, we had changes in curriculum, and you know, there are bumps in the road and, and you often question, why are we doing this? Why are we making this change? Um, one of our big changes was in our reading program and I felt very comfortable with um, the program that we had and, and wasn't sure that I agreed with um, the change. And so I started to research um, the new reading program and what was going on behind that. And, and then we had a change in um, administration in my building. And I started to see um, that the administrator that I had worked with for most of my career um, was very, very different from other, other administrators. I started to compare the two and, and to um, you know, think, well, I like this part. Um, of what this administrator did, and I see the, the good in what this administrator is doing, and you know, I think wouldn't a, a nice mesh of that um, work well? And so I just started to um, consider um, what it would be like to move outside the classroom and to go ahead with some leadership classes. So I entered the program um, that Andy is in charge of, the Educational Leadership Program, and really started with the first class. Um, they wanted us to talk about our vision of leadership and, and who we were as leaders, and I thought, you know, I don't know who I am as a leader. I'm just trying to find this out. But it really made you think um, and expand your um, expand those thoughts beyond those four walls of your classroom. When you're a teacher, you're in, you're in charge. Um, you know what your kids are doing at all times, and you're moving forward with the curriculum at the pace that you feel is correct. And um, you do have those outside influences, but for the most part, you close your door and you do um, what you think is best. And it really started to expand my horizons. And I, you know, now I know why it was approached this way. And now I understand why the district looked at this new reading program. And now I'm looking at the data. And I'm not just looking at my kids and what's, what works best for me. I'm looking at the bigger picture. And you know, as I was taking the classes, I would take one course and think, OK, this is good information, but I never want to do this. This is not something that I would ever do. And then I'd take the next class and think, oh, you know, maybe it is. Maybe I, maybe I could do this. Maybe I, I do want to be an administrator. It wasn't until I had the experience to um, actually do the internships. And I did, um, you know, working in the elementary building, I did the elementary internship first. And that's when I worked with Dr. Pushchak. Um, but I got the opportunity to work in the office and to um, work on some discipline and to sit in on data meetings. and. Um, to go to central office for some meetings and sit in on preliminary interviews and get the, that big picture and that started to expand and that, that's when it really solidified for me that yes, this is, this is something that I want to do. I'm ready to take this next step. I'm ready for a new challenge. Um, you know, I had taught for many years and again in that first and second grade realm and I was ready to spend more time with adults. And, uh, No, I no, no. I have not looked back. No, I I still get to spend time with the kids, um, but it, and it's something different every day, um, new challenges every day, and I still get to spend time with the elementary students, even though I'm um, mostly at the high school. Um, I graduated in 2009 from the educational leadership program, and then the following fall, I was hired as the um, district elementary assistant principal, which meant I traveled from one building to the next. Um, nobody had a full-time assistant at the elementary level at that point. I spent two days in one school, two days in another, two days in another. And that, was, that brought its own challenges, learning uh, three more leadership styles and how they wanted discipline handled and what my role was in each of those buildings. But it was also a wonderful opportunity to um, take the best of, of each world and, and put it together and, and make that part of my own philosophy. Um, the following year, which would have been last year, they eliminated that position and I moved up to the high school to where I am now. And that brought with it um, all kinds of new things. I hadn't been in a high school setting since I was in high school. So I, I did have the opportunity um, with an internship at the high school as well, but that was summer school and it was somewhat limited. So this has brought, you know, it's been a very eye-opening experience. It's wonderful. I really, I like the high school a lot. A lot of the kids that I am now dealing with at the high school level I had in first and second grade, which is an interesting twist. Um, <laughs> It's, I think, the biggest change from the elementary school to the high school well, is just how you talk to the kids. It's a lot of the same issues. It's um, you know, how do you get to their level and, and build that rapport and that respect with them. So that's been the biggest challenge, but um, it's been a great opportunity. And, and I, I see my role as, number one, as helping other teachers to do whatever they can to 
make sure that their students are learning to the best of their abilities and to open doors for them, to provide trainings for them, to provide support. Um, observations are a big part of my responsibilities going in and, and observing teachers and um, we follow the Charlotte Dan Danielson model um, which the state is now um, working towards as well and it's very much geared towards having every teacher understand that there's room for growth and that we're always pushing forward and we're always looking at that student data no matter how long you've been there no matter how how much you feel you have it down pat there's always room to grow and improve and um, you know, that's, that's not always easy. It's not always an easy spot to be in and as, as an administrator when you need your teachers to, um, you want them to respect you, you want them to, to want to follow you, but you also need them to understand that there are things that, that need to be, um, they need to grow, areas they need to grow and change. So that's, that's an ongoing um, conversation and, and ongoing work there. Um, as far as student leadership, and I feel that students need the opportunity from kindergarten on up to, you know, we, we sometimes look at the leader as the person who, you know, everybody looks towards that, um, has the bigger than life personality. And I think leadership is a lot more than that. It's being able to be a part of a team, that shared leadership, being ever, able to have a role and be successful in that role, to know what your role is, first of all, and then to know that you have a, a key piece in making your team or your group successful and be able to move forward. So I think that that's something that um, I know in our district we're really um, pushing with our teachers is to um, have that group dynamic and students understanding their roles and everybody being able to feel like a leader and have some success. And you know that goes from the kids, the teachers need to have that leadership capacity as well and through our PLCs that I mentioned before that's something that we're really going to be focusing on as a district and having the teachers understand how much influence that they have over uh, making positive changes for their not only their classroom, their department, for the school as a whole. Great. Thank you, students. I think um, that helps us definitely frame where your where your minds are and give us a better definition of what leadership means in the in the capacity of the students. Now it's time to put the spotlight on your professors. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do things, mix it up a little bit, keep you on your toes. I'm gonna direct this one to Professor Wirtz. Uh, I'd like you to talk about. How do you teach or how do you develop leadership in students? How do you identify it? How do you foster the fact that there are students, obviously, who have this leadership capacity? So what is your philosophy on that and what exactly do you do to teach leadership? Well, for me, teaching leadership is, a, is about empowerment of the students and empowering all of the students and seeing how they emerge and how they um, foster leadership in one another. Um, I think by giving them varied opportunities, um, setting some loose boundaries for them and some hard objectives, um, that enables them to take risks that, that facilitate leadership and, and allow them to emerge as, as both individuals um, and as members of the team within the classroom. I come from corporate America where sometimes taking a, a swing and a miss is maybe not that great, right? So how do you how do you foster that in students? Because it is okay. Yeah, and, and I and, and that comes with leadership. And I so. think uh, I think making sure that they know that it's okay to fail, um, especially in our environment, is is critically important. And it, it's funny that you talk about corporate America because I just somebody sent me a quote not long ago of Bill Gates who said you don't get to fail. You know why do we let kids fail in school if they can't fail in corporate America, but now's the time for them to fail and figure out what works and what doesn't work and, and, and what their place and what their role is um, in this scheme and whatever it is that they want to do. Um, and I think that there's a place for uh, accessible failure in corporate America too, but it's, it's much more reliant upon dollars and cents. And here, um, by giving students the opportunity to fail, not overall, of course, but maybe you know, in, in a project-based thing, allowing them to take some risk and learn um, what, was, uh, what was positive about taking that risk and what was negative about taking that risk and build and grow from there, I think it is an incredibly important part of the educational process. Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down to the end. Dr. Lane Bussell, same question to you, but really, what is your theory and how do you approach leadership in your classroom? And do you directly say, okay, this is going to be about leadership today, or do you let the students find their way and, and pick up that way? Um, it's interesting, as I looked over my notes, they're very similar to what Jim had said. And, and I think part of it is, is that as a, as a teacher, um, one of my roles is to help students take ownership of who they are and 
be responsible for what they do and to find their own voice in their own way because there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach to this. Um, and it really is a shaping process because when students come in, they're often, um, they really don't have a context for some of the experiences that, that lie ahead, even within the classroom. And so our role really is, is to help create this safe context that also takes them out of their comfort zone, the risk taking that, that Jim was talking about, that, that forces them to think about things in a different way, to act upon a task in a way that, that does challenge them to use their, their abilities and their, um, you know, their strengths, um, and, and, to, and to be okay knowing that they've given it their all. And I think that's the big thing is, is that if you try to f help students realize that it is important to, to be responsible in, in making a project your own and working to the best of your ability and being um, responsible for that, you're really instilling, le you're instilling leadership characteristics there without labeling it as such. I think that in our discipline, you know, we don't say this is a leadership task. I think in ROTC they probably do that. But I think what we're really getting at are the skill sets that, that, that build the leaders. And then by the time a student is ready to graduate, they can look back and say, yeah, you know, I, I really am at this place now where it's okay for me to be on a panel and to discuss things because <laughs> I, I'm confident enough and what I have done and what I know so that I can take it to that next step. And being able to work well with others is, is really huge. I mean, I think, that's, I think that's where successful leaders are. They're not managers, they're not telling people what to do, but they're really trying to nurture their, the strengths of the people that work with them. They're helping to minimize their weaknesses. They're helping them to realize that um, you know, that, that that's a particular skill that maybe doesn't work so well in this situation, but if you um, hone it or if you tweak it, it might work better in this situation. Um, and so our job, my job, is to, I think, to really challenge students, to expose them to new ideas and to help them move beyond. And, and we do that more directly through um, opportunities that we have. So and our research groups and our student organizations within the departments, there are those more formal leadership opportunities. So we recognize, um, similar, you know, to what, um, you know, what we were we were talking about um, with regard that Anthony said in terms of how he built himself up through the um, through the newspaper and how Shane developed his skills through ROTC and and then also how Laurie went from being a classroom teacher to an assistant principal. I think we do those same kinds of things academically here. You might start off, you know, you do start off as a low man, a low person, and then because you work hard, you realize that this is the niche for you, then you take on more and more responsibility. And as you do that, you are becoming a leader. Um, and, and I think that's what's so wonderful about what we do is that you can watch that developmental process take place and not everybody embraces it in the same way um, because not everybody has the same personality or the same drive or the same um, desire and that's good because there's need for all of what we do but the person who is looking at the bigger picture who begins to anticipate and plan and gets excited by that then that's probably the person who will be um, in charge of the project and um, you know help facilitate the group to go to the next level. And you, you touched on a number of leadership opportunities that you have. Do you have any words for advice for any of the students who are maybe hesitant to take on some of those leadership opportunities in research or, or whatever the opportunities are? What would you tell them if they're considering it but not quite ready to take that step yet? I think the best thing is right away is to not be afraid to talk to people because um, faculty aren't mind readers and um, there's usually at least one professor or that you feel comfortable with, go to them. You know, tell them what you're interested in and that person will help direct them to those opportunities that exist. But uh, we can't 
you know, figure out unless you open up to us. And, and don't be afraid. There's, uh, you know, you might not get the answer that you expected, but you might get an answer that will lead you to a really interesting place. So, you know, I know some students are kind of hesitant and shy and they think, I don't want to sound stupid and, you know, uh, you know, there's all these excuses. But, you know, take that first step. And, and talk to a professor. Now, if that really is tough for you, then find an upperclassman, that um, somebody that you may have seen in, around the building, in a class, um, involved in something. Um, talk to them. Um, go, to, go to activities that an organization might sponsor that you're interested in, and see who's there, and start making some connections. So I think there's multiple ways, and again, based upon what your comfort level is as a student, because not everybody will approach things the same way. I mean, there are some people who are real eager beavers, in, and there are other people who you can see looking there that there's that glimmer, that there's that excitement, but, you know, how do you, you know, so we're working on getting them to that next level to be able to do that. Great. Thank you. Dr. Pushek, same question for you on leadership, but you're in a position of educating people who are going to shape our future generations. So leadership is extremely important. So how do you foster leadership? How do you identify leadership? What is, is your approach to those students? Thinking about the question, I was thinking about the core sequence our students take, introduction to educational leadership. That's where we start out. And uh, uh, an emphasis in our program is not only what are your leadership skills and abilities, but how do you foster them in others? And we actually teach that. I'm thinking of another class, Educational Leadership Theory and Practice. So we talk about leadership theories, but then the piece that's important is, what does it mean to you? How can you implement that? And how can, how can you do that in our particular area in a positive way in a school system to facilitate change to increase or enhance student achievement? We have educational leadership in a pluralistic society, educational leadership from a global perspective. So we're trying to get our folks to see this. We're actually teaching classes. Um, each one of our classes has what we call a 15-hour field experience. Part of our accreditation is not only the internship hours, but also hours associated with each class. So we do have graduate students that 99% of them are professionals, they're full-time employees. Most of them are teachers in schools and school districts or educational organizations. And they have to apply what they're learning in each particular class in the field. And then they come back and report on that to us as faculty. And, you know, I, I wish I could capture what each of these students have said and use them as testimonials because it's such great stuff that they're learning. And we even take some leads from the military. Um, with, our, with our approach to leadership, Dwight Eisenhower said leadership is getting folks to do the things you want them to do because they want to do it. So how do we train our folks to get people to do the things they want them to do because those other people want to do it. So we really think to know thyself first before you know others. And then really, um, I think we're, we're very strong in the, the theory to practice piece. And we are in a position of, of graduate students. They have access to situations. We try to provide them with authentic simulations or projects to do. But then that all leads up to our culminating experience, which is the internship where we're not having them um, participate in new experiences. Hopefully they've done little experiences throughout their whole coursework. Now they can really concentrate on areas that they're strong in, areas that may need more leadership development. As Lori said, her first position was in three different buildings under three different leaders, also reporting to an assistant superintendent and a superintendent. So she was fortunate to see many different leadership styles and as you heard from her, I'll take this from one person, this from one person, to develop our own leadership style. And then, you also heard her say, I had to look at myself, what is my vision of leadership? What's my personal leadership vision? And that's what we start our folks off with. So we really do teach it. We teach leadership. We provide examples. We provide theory. We look at a uh, context of, of where are you now? Where do you need to be? Um, are you a leader of others? Do you want to be the person out front of, of the group? Do you want to guide from the side? What, what is going to be your, your leadership style? So we really feel that once our students have completed the program, they've completed their internships, 
they have a good, idea, very good idea of themselves and their leadership skills and abilities, but also to work with others. How do I work with someone who's like me? How do I work with someone who's totally different from me? And can I still motivate them to do good things for our students in schools? Since I'm the moderator, I think I'm allowed to throw a couple curveballs at you guys. I don't know if anybody throws anything at me. But um, Anthony, you touched on something that, that I see people struggle with uh, as they come into the workforce, which is influencing without authority. As you talked about, how do you influence your peers and you can't tell them what to do because they're your peers. And you successfully navigated that without making people mad. If you were to educate people, what do you think was the key thing that you did there to get everybody on board with you and become a natural leader without crossing over any lines? I think one of the, the most important things to do, first of all, is to keep things as motivating as possible. From my perspective, you know, I don't really want to tell people what to do, but I want to motivate them to do good work in general, first of all. So I would make sure that things were to emphasize the positives and to, instead of dwelling on anything negative, to try to just suggest improvements rather than to say, this is really bad and we can't do anything about it. You know, so, that, so I think that's just that kind of general atmosphere to begin with. And then as far as uh, fostering that individual leadership of people wanting to do things. I think delegating tasks is really important to make someone feel like they have a greater portion of leadership within the organization. So I think that's one of the things I definitely did and it's, it's one of the things I've done this year. Uh, one, of our, one of the students on my staff was really interested in working free TV. Obviously we have a lot of, we have 24 hours worth of programming to put on TV. And one of our students was really interested in developing more original programming to put on and you know, Different, th different ideas yet, you know, different interview shows, different music shows, things of that nature. So I said, okay, that sounds like a good idea. You're going to be in charge of it. So, and I think at first he was a little bit hesitant because he was like, I don't really know what to do. And he asked me for some pointers at first, but you know, he eventually got the handle of it. And we, we had a couple meetings with different people. We, we reached out to different uh, organizations on campus. We went to the, the film club and people like that. And we both went together, but I let him do most of the talking. You know, I introduced what we were doing and I said, this is Cam. This is Cam. He is going to be leading our original programming and I let him take it from there. So I think giving people an opportunity to do that themselves is something. To, to not only delegate things that you might want them to do, but to, if someone says that they might be interested in something, to let them kind of take the lead on it and just oversee what's happening. Great. I think I'm going to open this next question up to all of the professors and, and doctors on the panel, but um, maybe Professor Wurtz to start with. Have you seen the dependence on technology and the social media, the, the many outlets of social media that we have, have you seen that change your approach to leadership at all or change the way that you assess leadership in, in dealing with the, the way that we have social media everywhere and, and programming everywhere at this point? Has that changed your approach at all? I don't know if it's changed my approach to assessment of leadership qualities because I don't get to see how students interact all the time on social media. I generally only see them when they interact with me on social media. And certainly that is an indicator of, of leadership abilities or future success. Um, but uh, in general, I, I would have to say that I'm not, I'm not really sure. Um, certainly it has played an impact in in education, and, and I've incorporated Facebook and Twitter and forms of social media in some of my classes, particularly large lecture classes. But to the point that students emerge from that environment, I think it's more difficult to, to tell. I think where, where I see the challenge with that is, is that <clears throat> I think sometimes with leadership, you figure out how you work with a group when you're there. And so the informal networking that occurs prior to a class has really changed as a result of technology. So instead of students really talking with one another in the hallway before class or sitting in their seats chatting with one another, they're on their phones or they're texting. And so they are connecting with others, but they're not building these new, um, these new networks that they run into informally in a class. I think they do it when you give them assignment or you know you ask them to respond to things but I, th I think that whole aspect of um, the right word maybe is naturally occurring um, opportunities to to develop those types of skills um, on, in an interpersonal way um, face to face. I think that is changing. And I think there's a greater comfort with interacting with individuals via technology than there is interacting with individuals face-to-face.
face to face. And I think that's one of the things that a leader has to be able to do. And the hardest thing is to, to, to talk about difficult things. And if you're sitting down facing somebody, looking them in the eye, and having to, to have that heart-to-heart -heart talk, it, it's very different than if you're sending an email or you're texting them um, because you don't get the immediate facial reaction, you don't get the change in body language. And all of that is really important in terms of reading how somebody's going to respond and also helping you capitalize on how you can maximize their strengths and minimize their weaknesses. I think um, for our program, um, during the internship we have um, a web-based course shell in which our interns can interact. Uh, before we had that, Lori may be in Sagertown, someone else may be in Erie, someone else may be in Meadville, someone else may be in Fairview. When the internship comes, they never see each other. Mm -hmm. They're in class every week. I know what Lori's doing. Lori knows what I'm doing. So we have um, an opportunity for them to network, and we purposefully designed it so they do. It's not to be busy work for them, but they enjoy touching base. How's your internship going? What types of projects are you doing? What's your on-site supervisor like? Here's what my on-site supervisor, did they really ask you to do that? Wow, here's what I'm doing. Um, you know, are you going to get this assignment done? We have a, a, a focus project on student achievement we're supposed to be doing. What are you doing? So we really tried to connect our students once they go out into those internship areas. They're all busy professionals. They all have jobs in addition to doing their internships. But we really see a connection because at the end of each semester, we bring everybody back together. And they just are able to get that face time that they need with each other. I appreciated when you told me this about a year internship because it helped me when I was doing mine and it really got me through that. I enjoyed that weekly interaction with you online that they wouldn't normally get and, you know, that they wouldn't get if we didn't have that structure and, and format for them to do that. Um, we also use that as a place for professors where we can, we can uh, they can submit their logs, they can submit their reflections. So we also use it as a teaching tool during that internship piece. They're used to using that during their coursework, which they take online. And then when we go out to their sites to supervise them and to visit with them, we can look at everything online before we go out there and be all caught up and be current with them. But I really think it has enhanced our internship experience among the interns themselves because we hear that feedback from them. In the past, we used to have classes together, then we went and did our internships and never heard from each other again. And then now, we still maintain that connection. And I think that continues after the internships are over. And the, the last question before I open it up to the audience, I wanted to throw it to all three of the students. I'll start with you, Jane. I'll put you back on the spot. But if you were to choose one or two highlights from a leadership perspective, what would they be? What would you tell people that if you have the opportunity to do this, this helped me develop my leadership skills? Is it the ROTC? Is it leading a group project? But can you point to one or two examples that someone could really take advantage of to hone their leadership skills? Personally, uh, the most important one I think for, for my development was ROTC and being enlisted at the same time. Um, I can't peg one or the other per se because in my leadership style, I think it's important to work your way up from the ground. So I started off as a basic private E1 and learned that job all the way up to E4 before I make my commission with ROTC. As a leader, I think it's important to know every job underneath you um, and working your way up from the ground. So whether it's ROTC, whether it's another organization, I just think it's important to start from the very bottom, similar to what Anthony did, um, because you're a more effective leader if you know everybody's job underneath you. So uh, what I can't really say ROTC or any other university-based uh, activity group, but just start from the very bottom. That's, that's one piece of advice that I would have to give. Um, and just work your way up. Don't be too eager to try to jump into, jump into a leadership role. Um, and and the, other, the other piece of advice or group I would give is uh, to just be broad. The, a, a good leader has a wide basis of activities. Uh, I can't really attribute my leadership style to just ROTC or the military or to just Sakai and Tri Beta, but to my volunteer work in the healthcare field, my uh, volunteer work at the writing center, um, military, academics, just become a well-rounded leader. Don't focus on one thing. Similar to, you know, you did everything from the 
from the newspaper to the ETV and everything, everything in between. And it's important to to cover all the bases, you know, to because the the more broad a leader that you become, the better you are at the counseling that I talked about before, at the development and mentorship programs, because you know more about what the it's subordinates in the military, but what your subordinates and staff are doing, and you're better to help them get where they want to go and achieve their goals if you know, you know, a broad a broad range of a broad range of things for for them to go by. So. I would advise students to sort of take my route. I'm not trying to pump myself up in any way, but to gain leadership positions in more than one, especially within our department, the campus media organizations are really our best opportunities for leadership. And I was lucky enough to be able to lead from the top both The Spectator and ETV. So even if you don't ascend to those top positions, I would urge students to try to get leadership positions in we have three campus media organizations also, the two I was involved with and then WFSC, which is our campus radio station. So to attempt to get leadership positions on more than one, because within our field, there's so much overlap between what you're asked to do professionally that you need to be exposed to all of that to begin with. So you might as well try to master it as well as you can before you get out into the field. Um. The one thing that stands out in my mind is as um, I was working through the internships, which I already said were very valuable and very important um, in helping me know where it was that I wanted to go. Um, taking something that um, showed up through the focus project that we did, which was a need for curriculum mapping and a need to bring teachers together and have, um, have them know exactly what students need to know and be able to do at a grade level to move on and, and coming together. We, I saw that as a need, took it out to the teachers, um, and got in input from them that yes, they saw it as a need also, and then running with that, and we were actually able to, you know, through a research project that followed the, um, the internship, able to get um, district the district on board with some curriculum mapping and, and really um, change the direction, change the course of what was going on in the district. And I think for uh, new leaders or students coming up wanting to build leadership ability. They need to find something that they're passionate about, something that they care about, something that matters to them. You know, that mattered to me personally. It mattered to my colleagues. Um, you know, when we did things like putting surveys out to see, you know, how much they cared and how much they were willing to put into it, and then taking that on to the next step and presenting it and saying, you know, here's what we found out. What can we do? And you know, how can we help this? Um, how can we get this in place? And I think it starts with taking that that one thing that is important to you and, and going with it. And if you work yourself through one project and you see some success, um, and you see that people do listen, people um, people care what you have to say, people care what you're thinking about, then I think that gives you the drive to 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 go to the next project and the next step and look for that next thing that's going to make a difference. Now I'd like to give the, the teams the opportunity to address these questions together. Um, so we'll go to our psychology team first, but I want you guys to just tell us a little bit about your mentorship relationship and, and how you came to this, this relationship now where you feel as if you have a mentor um, in your professor and how that grew and how that has opened up leadership opportunities for you. Um, I guess I'll start if you don't mind, Dr. Lee. Uh, Dr. O.B. and I met on my first day of orientation. I came in on a day that wasn't actually reserved for psychology, so <laughs> I was the only student here. Um, and we actually sat down and, and had a discussion, and I was, a, in my own mind, a relatively immature and fresh, uh, incoming freshman. I didn't know too much. I wasn't very strong academically, per se, but uh, you know, I was, I was eager to be here. I was excited to learn, and uh, I, I think that Dr. O.B. probably took notice of that. And, uh, just each year we began talking a little bit more. I began, became a little bit more involved uh, on campus and, and specifically the psychology department. And I think everything kind of just blossomed from there on, on my perspective between uh, like a working relationship and talking and just opportunities coming up and uh, me trying to take every opportunity that, that came my way. So. And I think that that's really the important point that Shane said, he took advantage of the opportunities that came his way. And as department chair, I really think that that's a big part of my job is to, to look and see what's available and then to help provide those to students who are eager and willing. And 
Um, sometimes it, it involves a direct, um, more direct approach, and sometimes it's a little bit more indirect. But um, I think Shane and I, we had class together, and what's really been amazing is to watch how with each step, each course, each year that passes, each new activity that he got involved with, how his, his confidence has grown and his ability to, um, to look at more issues and to realize the potential that he has. And, um, and especially, I just, he's going to medical school. And that's one of the things that, that people often say, you're going to medical school with a psych degree. And yeah, you know, um, psychology is a really good background for that as long as you get the appropriate chem and bio courses along with it. And I think that's what we try to be as innovative. And, and so we saw that that really was the best niche. And I think as a chairperson, as a professor, um, I need to be responsive to the niches that my students are trying to carve out for themselves. And our mentoring relationship is different than Shane's mentoring relationship with his primary research professor, with the, um, ad, um, the advisor for Psychi, the Honor Society. So in many ways, students who become involved and take on these roles have multiple mentors. And, and just as Lori was able to have those experiences as a teacher looking at different principles, I think our students have similar types of experiences by looking at faculty that they've had either as instructors or had this outside the classroom relationship with. And I feel very fortunate that in our program we have a number of those things and we have a wide variety of students who uh, who choose to um, take it to the next level and to, to keep growing as, as people and the faculty embrace that as well. Um, does that answer, is that what? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Thank you. Communications team, talk a little bit about the, the, the mentorship <laughs> and the leadership and how it's, how it's changed. In my four years of being involved with Campus Media, I've had four different advisors. So this is my first year with, with Professor Wirtz and my advisor. But they all had varying degrees of success, all had different styles, and I've seen blow-ups, I've seen a lot of different things. So I mean, within them, I was exposed to a lot of different kinds of advising in, in those three years previous to this year. But I've had professors in most of the classes you teach here. I think I've taken almost everything you teach, because I always respected him as a professor and got a lot out of his classes. But I was also involved with ETV as a student before I got a paid position with her, which I have now, but I was always around. And one of the things that always struck me, one of the things I took away from being involved with ETV is the reverence that the students have for Professor Wirtz. It's just almost like he's a celebrity in their <laughs> eyes. I mean, I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to massage your ego, but the students just generally think the world of him because he is hands-on, but not to the point where he's overbearing in any way, and he's also extremely accessible. I know if I send him an email, then he's going to get back to me within a couple minutes. So it's nice to be able to have that kind of contact to get immediate responses. And I know that any time I can schedule a meeting with him and we can sit down and talk for an hour about whatever kind of things are going on in life, you know, even if it extends to things that are outside of what we're immediately talking about. And I've always respected his opinion because he's always kept me grounded in such a way that he's going to be real and he's going to challenge you if there's something that he doesn't necessarily agree with that you say, he's going to make you think about it. So you might reconsider things. And I think that's very helpful as an advisor to not disagree with you outwardly to the point of saying that's wrong, but to say maybe you want to think about that or just to bring other sides in. And that's, that's one of the big things that I appreciate that he does for all of us. Educate us on how to become a... <laughs> well, I don't, know, I don't know if I can live up to the, uh, the aura that Anthony's just put out there. But I, I think from my perspective, it's all about um, opportunity, as Cindy said. And, and also, um, as Anthony suggested, I, I like to make myself available to my students and particularly my ETV students because they're here um, many hours that, that no one else is on campus on weekends setting up uh, doing live broadcasts of athletic events and um, and other things like this uh, event tonight and so um, if they're having difficulty or if they need to reach out to me they know that they always can and that I'll always a answer the phone or call back immediately those kinds of things and so um, I think that's critically important and, and, it, and it also um, models for them, I think, a, a kind of a, attention to detail and to the things that really are important in any kind of um, in any kind of opportunity or any kind of role that you have. 
um, that you need to be attentive to those things. And so I, I just try to put that out there for them. Educational leadership. Tell us about that. Well, Dr. Pushchak was, um, he taught at least one of the classes that I took online. I'm, I Probably more than that. But um, really I hadn't met face to face until we uh, did the internship experience. And he was, again, very accessible. Um, email, phone number, anything that you need. Um, very supportive, um, very willing to sit down and look at what I was doing and to say, you know, you've had good experiences in this area, what about this area, and how could you get these, and, and you know, what's going to move you um, to the next level. Um, very supportive in uh, setting up the, the project, um, the data project that we did, and, and helping me come up with a good researchable question and um, really focus on what was important and how uh, come up with how we can um, look at that student data from you know, teacher perspectives and, and uh, bring it all together and just providing the guidance along the way. I, I'm going to share a situation that I remember from the internship experience. Should which, step out of the <laughs> No, which, which our students run into from time to time that she was doing a project that, sh that the other administrators should have already been doing within her district. The curriculum mapping was nothing new. She really saw the need and the opportunity to, to facilitate that process and the, perhaps the elementary supervisor at that time may have been intimidated by what an intern was doing. And something as simple as scheduling the use of a computer lab at central office turned into a big deal. Do you remember that? Yeah, I knew that's what you, I, said. you know, and she and I sat down and talked about that. And we talked about, first of all, what is your place as the intern? You're an employee. You're responsible for your job, first of all. The internship is secondary. But at the same time, look at what you're doing. You're being noticed. You're doing good things. The teachers, she's talked about teacher perspectives. She surveyed teachers about their perceptions about this process and what needs to be done in the direction they need to go. Um, and I remember having that frank conversation with her. I even remember it was in a, uh, a building attached to the back of the, uh, the, book room. the book room is where we had to meet. I, I re it was cold. It was in the middle. I remember that. But we sat there, and that, that may have been a very rewarding experience for the both of us because she realized that she said, what do I do now? I said, yeah, what do you do now? Welcome to leadership. Here we go. And it was great because she was professional. She handled it very well. She was well respected before that incident. After that incident, that person has since left and leaps and bounds have been made since that person has been left. And look where she is now. So I think that those connections that we make, she could call me on the phone afterwards and say, Andy, wow, I never thought that would have happened. But at the same time, she'd call me and say, Andy, I have an opportunity for an interview this week. Any ideas, any tips, here's the district, here's what they're looking at. And we had that rapport and that, that, that mentoring relationship that she felt comfortable to call me and I felt comfortable to call her to say, Lori, here's an opportunity may you want to may pursue. Well, if those opportunities weren't the right one at the right time, boy, they certainly did come along. And I personally think her administration knew she was looking elsewhere and they said, we better get her a job here before she goes somewhere else. So. I, I really appreciate that, that relationship that we can build with, with our students, and I'm glad they realize that we try to do that and to help them. Okay. Sorry for sharing that no, experience. She's not but I, she's, she's, she's okay. She's not running. She's okay. Um, I think a, a successful mentor-mentee relationship takes work on, on both sides, obviously. So for the educators, uh, what do you expect of a mentee? Because um, I know in, in, in my line, people will come to me and just say, I want a new job. Okay, we can go a lot of places with this. So what do you expect of a mentee? What do you want them to have prepared when they come to you? Or what are your expectations? Top two, top three, to really have a successful relationship with your, ment with your mentees. I'll open up to whoever has a top two. If I could just build upon what I just discussed about Lori, I think number one is honesty. Are you honest with yourself? And then are you going to be honest with me? Um, are, are you going to tell me things that you're really not excited about doing? Are you going to do them anyways, or are you just not going to do them and then tell me you did them? So there's, this, there's a honesty, I think, 
And it's, it's one of our standards, acting with integrity, fairness, and in an ethical manner. That's one of our leadership standards. And by the way, it's the one that we've been rated on highest by our accreditation. We want to point that out. Um, but it, it's true. Um, <laughs> you know, are, are we going to develop not only instructional leaders, but ethical leaders? You know, when the times are tough and it's a situation where it's going to make a tough call on your part and there may be some winners and losers, but you know that you're going to make this decision based upon the best information you have and it's going to be in the best interest, for, in our situation, in the best interest of your students. Um, you know, are, are you going to be honest? Because you need to be honest with yourself. But then also I, I expect that from the mentor-mentee relationship. And I think all of the faculty in our program are open and willing to have those frank discussions with students. We're dealing with, with graduate students, not undergraduate students, so we have an approach that you need to make an adult decision, okay, because you're big boys and girls now. And then we also say this is a leadership program. It's not going to get easier when you're, you know, magically in a leadership position or if you're, if, you know, if you're a principal, it doesn't just automatically happen that you're going to be able to do all things for all people. Um, so I, I think honesty, that's number one for us. I would add commitment to that, uh, especially for my undergraduate students, commitment to each other, commitment to the peers, and a commitment to the product. Um, maybe more than any other program on campus, ours is, is a practical-based program. And, and if the commitment to the product isn't there, that shows. And 4,000 households in the Edinburgh community see that, and everybody on campus sees it. And so it, it's very important that they understand that early and, and maintain that commitment. And, and part of that commitment, I would say, is honesty and being honest with themselves and with each other because if they don't have that rapport um, within the group, that kind of commitment won't survive. And I think the third, because those top, top two, the Still third one <laughs> <laughs> would be a willingness to learn. I think that if, if a mentee comes in with the attitude that they know everything and aren't open, to new possibilities, new ways of doing things, new ideas, new people, um, then it's going to make it tough because it is about a, a willingness to be open to perspectives. But also, you have to know yourself. And so how does that fit in with your frame of reference to the rest of the world? Because a mentor will challenge you. And um, how receptive are you to that and how are you going to respond to it? And for the students, as you move to, to new chapters, whenever those are new jobs or new, new education, uh, what will you look for in a mentor? Then, top characteristic if it's honesty, or, or are you looking for something a little bit different? Uh, I think my top one is uh, it's going to be a mixture of compassion and attention. I think whenever I look for a mentor, and I hate to single Dr. LB out, it's uh, whenever I go to her office, it's this compassion and genuineness where she knows what I'm doing. She knows, you know, a lot about me as an individual. It's not a, just a, oh, well, I have a whole bunch of people underneath me already. I don't really have time to worry about the details of, of your life. She genuinely knows me as a person. She knows the things that I've done and what I hope to accomplish in my life. And I think that's important in a working relationship between a mentor and a mentee, somebody who genuinely knows you, knows what your goals are that you hope to accomplish, knows where you want to end up five years from now, ten years from now, and, and can help you, you know, move along the track to that. I can go. Go ahead. I would agree with what Shane says, first of all, with getting to know that person is very important. And I think jumping off that, because Professor Wards knew me, it was a lot of trust, which I appreciated, because from the beginning of whenever we started to do projects for UTV, like our weekly newscast. He was there, but he was pretty much just in the background and letting things unfold. And that was something that we didn't even talk about at the time, and there was no issues with that. We met later, and he said, you know what, is, is everything okay with that? Because I kind of just figured that you can handle everything, and you're equipped to do it. So I did it, and I was like, no, that works out fine with me. So it was just even that kind of that intrinsic knowledge of where we both stood was really helpful for me. I think in my position now, um the principal that I work with is a very good mentor for me. He's been there for quite a while, and um, we have similar, similar approaches um, to discipline and, and to how we handle um, difficult situations. But I think I would have to agree with the honesty and the openness. Um, 
he said right from the beginning when I, when I started there last year, you know, you need to be able to come into the office and close the door and tell me that I'm wrong and I need to be able to do the same for you and you need to be able to accept that and, and as, I will, as I will do the same and um, so that we can learn from each other. And I, I think that willingness to, to lay it on the line and um, say here it is and, and here's what I've seen and this is what you did great and this, this is what needs to be improved and um, then on the reciprocal end be able to accept that and, and learn from it and grow. So I just think you need to have that, that trusting, open, respectful relationship where you can be honest with one another. So I think we're to the point now where I will open it up to the audience. Um, before we do that, I, did, I didn't want to take away from the, the thunder of the panel, but I wanted to introduce myself because I didn't at the beginning. I wanted to leave it all up to the panel. But my name is Kimberly Ferris. I'm a 1999 graduate of Edinburgh. Clearly accelerated program, graduated very young. <laughs> uh, business and administration, and I'm currently a human resource manager at GE here in Erie. So that's my background. I'd like to open it up to anyone in the audience at this point. If you have any questions for our leaders, that can go ahead. Do you think that individuals are born leaders, or is it something that they have to be learned? Everybody hear the question? Okay. Anyone want to volunteer to field that one? If not, I'll start. I, I can I can start uh, from a military perspective I kind of look at it as a combination of both and I know that's kind of a on the fence answer but <laughs> I think I think that there are individuals who are are natural born leaders and they take less facilitation I guess to pull their leadership abilities out um, but that's not to say that others can't be taught leadership through through practice and dedication um, I do believe it's easier for certain people uh, as I said you know that just have this natural born tendency people uh, tend to gravitate towards them I'm sure you've noticed those people throughout throughout your lives but then there's others who you might think uh, I don't expect him to become a leader and through hard work dedication and just you know learning he he or she may you know grow up to become a great leader so again I think I think a lot of it stems from too is just putting time in, uh, you know, starting off at the very bottom, learning everything that you can about everybody's job, and just, you know, do I, as bad as it sounds, just do put your time in, uh, put your work in before you can step up to that next leadership role. So, I'd like to hear from the education on, on this on our team here. Do you think that it's something that you can teach, or does it have to be born in you? I definitely I agree with what he said. I think it's a, a definite combination, and I think I touched um, at the very beginning that there are the, the people that are charismatic and everybody looks to as, as the leader, but leadership can be fostered in our students in those shared leadership opportunities, those, that group work where everybody has a role and everybody has um, a part in making the team and the group successful. But I do think that that part has to be taught. Every, um, kids don't necessarily know that um, if that isn't natural for them, they don't think that they can do it. It's something that has to be fostered and, and grown and, and specifically taught. Um, from a young age, I think the younger that it starts, the better. Um, I am not a public speaker. I was very nervous about this tonight. It's not a strong point. And for a long time, um, I thought that this was not something that I could do because that is not, um, I don't love to be in front of people, in front of crowds, but I, I force myself into these kinds of things so that I can get a little better at it each time. Uh, but I have other strengths um, that have been brought out through this program in particular. Um, that helped me be successful in lots of other ways. So I'm sure you could tell that I was not the most fluent speaker tonight, but that's, um, again, I have other areas. I thought she did very well. <laughs> I just wanted to, um, if I can finish up. Um, from the entire panel tonight, we've heard something that we call in our program leadership at all levels. Leadership is not just in the principal's office, just not in the chairperson's office, just not in even in the president's office. But leadership is at all levels. And I think some people need taught the skills and abilities to, to, to become that leader. So if we can foster leadership at all levels as students, as employees, as subordinates, superordinates, um, I, I think it can be taught. But I think what, what, when Lori says the charismatic leader that everybody looks to, I think you have to be a people person to be a leader. So I think if you're a people person and have people skills, I think you can learn that, the, the, the leadership piece to take you to the next level. But if you don't have the basics of 
how to work with people, I think you're going to struggle to become a leader. Sorry. Oh, no, you're fine. Because that's actually similar to what I wanted to say. I think there are definitely people who are predisposed to being leaders, but I think that that kind of labeling of being a natural leader can be destructive to people at times because if you're constantly told this and you think that the way you're leading and whatever opportunities you're having is the only way to do it, then you're going to struggle because I think the most important thing I learned through my leadership opportunities here is that it's all about adjustment because not even, I mean, not even different groups, even within different members of the same group, you're going to have to treat them differently to get what you want out of them. I just think that part of a facilitating leadership is helping, is, is generating that spark that, that some person just might need to have that aha phenomena that, that, you know, yeah, I can do this. Or I've already been doing this on this level, but I didn't know how to, to, to capitalize upon it. And, you know, why am I so frustrated here when I think I could do it better? And, and so, as a mentor or as an educator or as a supervisor, if we, you know, if, if we can just provide opportunities that for individuals to see, to, to have that spark aha kind of a, an experience, then that really will help them find their, their niche in that way. One each of our student <laughs> representatives, right. specific to each of okay. them. I'd like to start with Shane. And Dr. LB touched on this when she said some people would view an undergraduate degree in psychology as perhaps not the typical preparation for medical school. I would think probably even more people would assume that perhaps an ROTC background is not necessarily the uh, typical preparation for medical school. Yet you project a clear confidence, and you project, at least to me, a person who's very focused, who has their eyes on the prize. So obviously you think that ROTC and obtaining an undergraduate degree in psychology are excellent preparation for medical school, and I'd just like you to tell us a little more about why you feel that way. Sure. Uh, I'll start off with psychology, if I may. Uh, I'm actually pursuing a degree in osteopathic medicine, which uh, the difference is it's a more holistic view over the, the whole body and everything of that nature. Um, and I believe that a psychology degree is absolutely perfect for that because not only do I get to work with medicine and specific illnesses, but I also get to, to work with individuals on an entire level. I get to work with you know, them as they are. I get to work with the mind, the body, the spirit, and also pursue a neurology degree if I so choose. Um, my psychology degree has also afforded me opportunities to work with individuals on a more personal level. I, I volunteered in the emergency room at St. Vincent for the past two years, and a lot of my work was dealt directly with patients, where I would transport them throughout the hospital, converse with them, talk to them about their illnesses, and, and I felt like I really got to know them on a personal level each time that I worked with one. Um, and I've also done habilitation work one-on-one -on -one with individuals with mental retardation, which has also just helped me not only psych psychologically and with my psychology background, but also uh, in medicine because it affords me more opportunities to work one-on-one -on -one with patients. Uh, my ROTC background also provides me, as I said, with, with a leadership ability that I think is a necessity in medicine today. Um, whether it's in the emergency room, neurology, cardiology, things of that nature, you need to effectively work with other individuals. You need to take initiative to accomplish certain goals and you need to be able to think quickly with mental agility and, and ROTC affords me all of those opportunities to be able to think on my feet, work with people of multiple backgrounds and uh, nationalities and, and also to, to stay focused and I think that that's something the military has helped me with too with time management, uh, ROTC, uh, I've woken up every day for the past four years at five o'clock in the morning and also managed to carry 20 credit semester loads and things of that nature so I think time management is also a very big one for, for doctors because you have a lot to accomplish in, in a small amount of time per day. So, um, Next question is for Lori. Um, our son, like Kim, is a distinguished graduate of the business program at Edinburgh. He's also a distinguished graduate of Sager Town Junior Senior High School. <laughs> he now lives and works in Pittsburgh in law enforcement. He visited us just yesterday and remarked that he can't believe that in only the two years he's been away that he's been in 
an urban environment, he feels somewhat out of place when he returns to the ruralness of Crawford County. When it comes to K through 12 education, most of the focus we hear on issues in K through 12 education is in, for obvious reasons, the urban environment. But you know, we happen to appreciate the environment you work in, which is about as rural um, as an <laughs> educational administrator could work in. It's not Maplewood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you talked about right. driving between the schools and the district. Um, what do you think some of the unique challenges are to rural public education in Pennsylvania? Well, in the last, I'd say, eight years, our population of students who are so um, economically disadvantaged has gone up dramatically. Um, I believe we were somewhere around the 25% uh, range when I first started teaching. I know there were times that we had trouble securing Title I funding because our numbers were too low and we were soliciting people to you know, make sure you fill out these forms if you're in need just to get the, the minimum number. And that has changed pretty dramatically to, to where now um, the Segertown attendance area at the elementary level is a Title I school, which means we have our funding is distri distributed a lot different because of that, that change in population. And that's affected a lot of things. It's affected, um, it's affected our scores. Um, it's affected um, behaviors that are happening in the classroom. It's affected how uh, parents view education. It's not um, a top priority for the majority anymore. Um, so that's something that we are constantly um, trying to find ways to counteract and you know, su provide supports for those students. You know, where we're falling down on our PSSA scores is in that subgroup. And um, we just we have to find ways to support them and help them be successful um, despite what's going on outside the classroom in their homes. So that's probably the biggest one at this point as far as rural. I'll ask for questions for the guy in the press on the panel. <laughs> you know, this panel is a, a good example but uh, typically the professor-student relationship is not necessarily an equal relationship. Is the authority obviously is associated with the professor. You've alluded to some of this in, in your description of the revered professor work. <laughs> but you know, we do in the department, we do set the campus media organizations where your relationship with your faculty advisor is more of a peer relationship. It, it is a relatively uh, equal relationship. And even in your dealings with me as a department chair, you know we'll close the door and we'll be candid and you'll know I'll say things to you that in a way that I might not say them to people <laughs> outside because even we have more of a, of a peer relationship. I, I just, I, I wonder if, if you, you know, appreciate the uniqueness of that and, and if you feel that has anything to do with the relative success of the media groups. Absolutely, because I think, you know, I've been involved in campus media organizations where advisors were much more hands-off, and I think that's really detrimental to the final product, first of all, because as much as we're really trusted to do a lot on our own, and that's helpful for us because we need to figure it out, and if we're going to fail, we need to fail on our own, really, and then we need to take the flock for it and fix it fix it and the advisors would be there for us to do that. But there were times when I didn't really have relationships at all with my advisors and that's really isolating whenever you're in this kind of position because you want to be able to have someone that you can go to to even talk about matters that are strictly related to what you're doing. But the kind of relationship that I have with you and that I have with Professor Wirtz, I know I can talk to you guys about anything and it's also really helpful for me to be able to talk about things that might be outside of the department. Things that go on on campus that you guys might not hear about from within the administration, within the faculty, but that I gather from students that I know I can talk to you guys about in a way that I can be open and that it's going to all work out in the end and we're going to try to figure out a solution together rather than just you thinking that I'm overstepping my bounds in some way or anything like that. So. How do you feel that you are influencing high school girls? 
Okay. <laughs> the pressure's on now. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I gave you the soft. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, the uh, assistant principal who was there prior to me um, was also a woman. Jen Stevens was there for quite some time. So I think um, it, it's actually, uh, it's very helpful as far as our partnership, Mr. Wilson, the principal, and myself, um, to have the male and the female role so that there are certain situations that lend themselves better for a woman to approach it and others that um, the man needs to approach it, you know, if you have... Um, certain discipline situations where if there's a search um, involved, then we, you know, we, we have the opportunity for um, both situations to be handled appropriately. Um, I think, again, um, whether we're dealing with boys and girls, if we're talking about the, there's a lot of girl drama that happens at the high school, um, I think I have some good perspective on that. I'm able to, to listen to that and, and you know, hear them out and from a, from a girl's perspective, say, okay, you know, I kind of get the feeling that you're liking this drama at this point, or come on, tell me the truth. Yeah, I kind of like the drama, so what are we going to do about this? So I can, um, I can take that softer approach when necessary and that I've been there um, kind of approach as well. Um, but, you know, we both deal with, with both male and female students um, throughout the day. Depending on the situation, sometimes we deal with things together. So I do think that it's helpful to have a woman in the building. Um, I also think it's, it's helpful to have a man in the building. I think it's a really good um, partnership that we have. Um, as far as rural opp opportunities for leadership for the girls, um, there are lots of different um, clubs and organizations. Of course, you know, you have the traditional, you have the cheerleading, and you have the sports, and we have lots of students who are involved, boys and girls, who are involved in the sports, um, which provides all kinds of natural leadership um, opportunities. But we also have Key Club and Student Council and um, different uh, journalism and, and yearbook and lots of different opportunities for girls. And I think in a lot of those cases, girls are the ones who like to slip into those leadership roles in the, at the high school level, especially where, where at times um, boys are more interested in the other things going on. Right now we have an all-boy um, student council our senior student council are all boys, which is a big shift from last year. And um, they handle things very differently. Their approach is very different. So you have to adapt and adjust to that. But I, I think there are, are equal opportunities, really, um, for both males and females, depending on what their interests are. I don't know if that fully interests you. Ask what you I hope so. I think that I... I have built some very good close relationships with with some girls. I have some girls who come down to to visit me, and I'm I act as a mentor for them. Um, I have one student who actually graduated last year who contacts me on a very regular basis, and, and we, we discuss how college is going, and and I provide her with supports and suggestions, and she asks questions. And you know, being, last year was my first year, so it takes a while to build that to build that rapport. But I think that we're that we're getting there, and this year, I've noticed there are more girls that, that stop by to see me and um, that I make a point of showing up where I know they're going to be to provide the supports that they need. And being part of the, actually, the leader of the SAP program, that's our student assistance program, um, I have a lot of opportunities to talk to, to girls who are troubled for whatever reason, trouble with academics, trouble with home, trouble with a bullying situation, with, with girl drama. Um, so I, I work one-on-one -on -one with many different students of, of both genders, but a, a lot of good girl opportunities as well. Any other questions for the audience? I have another one. <laughs> so the you're all surprised at that. So the reason we're here is, is you're getting a new president, so I'm going to open this up to the educators on the panel. Um, sometimes change causes conflict or, or uneasiness, so you're in the realm now of a new leader. Um, have you ever run across challenges in your leadership, whether it be from a new leader or a new scenario, and how do you deal with <coughs> challenges to your leadership? <laughs> Just don't talk about it. <laughs> um, this is our third president in three years. And, and I think, as been a, s stated before, um, you have to be flexible and you have to adapt. 
I think you need to have what your leadership approach and style is. You, you need to be true to yourself, which was also stated before. And, and if you know what you're about, then I guess you try to figure out what the new person in charge's style is and what they're, um, what they're all about. And then you try to find a way to have a happy marriage. And that, it, it does pose challenges um, when you have a, new, a change in administration. Um, I'm the oldest one on this panel. Experience. Experience, experience. yes. Experience. Yeah. I have the, the, the most degrees of experience here looking across everyone who've been through multiple presidents at more than one institution. And, um, you know, sometimes it is really difficult because you can have a program rolling really well and all the, all the players are on the same page and then somebody at the top comes in and decides that there are new priorities. And, and that can be very challenging. Um, I had a major research program, a community service research program at, a, 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 at an institution um, that involved students and had been doing it for a number of years. But as the leadership at that institution um, that we did this work at, and I don't want to name any names. Um, we can change that. We can put a little asterisk. Okay. <laughs> change um, but as the leadership kept changing there, they kept having different expectations for what this program was to be and the type of support that they as an institution were willing to give it. And that became very difficult. And then at some point, you have to really ask, your question, ask yourself, is this really what I signed up for? And am I continuing to achieve the goals that I want to achieve? And so sometimes the best decision is to move on. Um, but that's not, all, that's not easy to do. Um, and, and it has to be, I think, when we're looking at employment and career development, that you know, you're, you're um, weighing the necessities of um, your income, but you're also weighing that more important piece, especially those of us who are fortunate enough to have careers, that is this career fulfilling? You know, is this providing me opportunities to, to really develop my skills and to be excited about what I want to do? And if I'm a leader in that position, can I really influence the folks who work with me in the way that I think is best? Um, my style, I'm not a very directive person. I believe that, you know, we're a team, that we all have to take ownership of it because the person in charge will change. And if we're going to institute practices and procedures, then those who are responsible need to buy into it. And so a, a, faculty, a faculty department is different than another organization, perhaps, in that sense. But my faculty and I have to be on the same page for things. And, um, it has to be our approach. It has to be our department, not my department. And I want them to be pursuing careers that make them excited to come in every day so that when they are approaching retirement, they can look back and say, you know, I really did what I wanted to do. And I want them to remember what that made them excited about doing this. So, you know, when they're at, I have a few that are at gym stage of the career and you know there is that excitement um, because there's all this possibility and potential but then as you go 10 years 20 years out it's easy for cynicism and frustration to build in and you really don't want that because that that limits what you what you can achieve and so yes I've been through multiple presidents I've been through leaders in, in other places and um, Sometimes I haven't been taken seriously because I was the only woman. I was the token woman. Um, but you understand that. And so you look at what you can achieve. Um, but I think you have to be true to yourself. You have to be true to what your um, ethical standards are. But I think you also have to have a vision of, of what you want and a willingness to work to achieve it and, and to just enjoy it. I mean, that's, I think good leaders are ones that like what they're doing and that they're not, um, they're facilitating what's best in people. I'd like to compliment what Cindy just said because it's so true. 
I think if you have a, a collaborative group of people working together, as she just said, that has a clear vision and a clear direction and you support each other, I think you can um, overcome any challenges that may be presented by new leaders. Um, as she said, three presidents in three years. In, in our program, um, I was asked in an interview, what's the strength of your program? And it didn't take me two seconds to determine. It's the faculty. We work together. We actually model what we teach. We have shared leadership among the faculty in our program. And I really think when challenges present themselves, we really come together and do what we have to do to get the job done. We've seen an explosion in growth in our enrollment, and we've seen a contraction in our enrollment. And through those really times where we had 400 students in a graduate program, which is huge, to now we're back down to around the 200s, we've really still maintained the focus, the direction, the clear vision, the support of each other, the collaboration of each other. And it's, it's really nice because students have said to me, I know no matter who I go to, I'm going to get the same answer, which is nice because we really believe in what we do. We're very, very clear focus, a very clear direction. And, and of course, we want to model that for our students. But to hear our students say that, um, so when those challenges do present themselves, we can really come together and either come up with a new plan or modify the existing plan or support each other. Sometimes we have to stand our ground. Part of leadership is standing up to other leaders. Um, but we know when to do that and when not to do that. What, what battles are we willing to take on and really dig our heels in for? And which ones can we say, yeah, we can work with that. We can do what we're being asked. We can modify and adjust a little bit what we do. And our, 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 one of our favorite sayings from the military, from the Marines, is improvise, overcome, and adapt. And that's what we like to teach our people. When you're a principal and you have to make a decision in two seconds of whether you're going to shut the building down or whether you're going to evacuate the building or whether you have a situation that's it's a very severe nature, you're going to improvise, overcome, and adapt. And I think if you can do those things as a faculty, as a group of people, as an organization, you can weather those challenges that may present themselves. I think uh, because I'm the, <laughs> the uh, I'm early in my career. <laughs> I, uh, Less experience, that way, right? <laughs> I, I wouldn't prefer that. No, <laughs> I think that it's uh, you know. By the virtue of my role here, I don't have to interact with administration as much as Andy or Cindy does, and I, and I think that that allows me to remain student-focused, um, not that they're not, but, I, but in a different way, because I don't have to deal with the, the tide or tenor of the university um, a, as much as they might. And I think that, that in these times of change, when you go through three presidents in three years and you have the, this kind of constant shift, it's important. Um, to, to create some modicum of stability for the students um, because it, if that gets lost in the shuffle, um, fostering leadership among students will be impossible. Any other questions at this time from the audience? Okay. I'll open up to the panel for closing remarks if you'd all like to give us one last uh, piece of advice or, or best practice that we can carry forward, I'll just go down the line and start with you about leadership and what we can do to all become better leaders. I would say be a respectful listener. Um, listen to, your, in my case, your teachers, your students, hear what they're saying, and be willing to be um, responsive to that. Thank you. I think leadership is a people business. You have to be able to work with people, understand people, and try to get the best out of people. I think it's all about people. I'd say the best way to gain practical leadership experience is to just expose yourself to as many situations and different groups of people as you can, because it's not necessarily going to generalize as to what you're doing. So the more people and situations you can expose yourself to and learn to adjust, but also take away what works and doesn't work with people in general, I think is really helpful. Empathize and remain flexible. Those are the two things that I think are, are most important, um, especially at this level of, of dealing with people. You know, it's one thing when you're dealing with other adults, but when you're dealing with young adults, it can be uh, oh so important. 
Uh, three things I think are important to remember, just like Professor Ward said. Uh, empathy is one of the main ones, but uh, also communication and mental agility. Uh, just being able to think on your feet and make quick decisions. Uh, it's the most important thing that you can do as a leader, because uh, at least in my business, you have lives directly in your hands. So just think on your feet, think quickly, but always understand where the other people are coming from when you make your decisions. And I think tied into that is being appreciative of, um, of people's circumstances and um, the task ahead and what all it really demands. And, um, and then so then that allows you to be more realistic too about outcomes and opportunities. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the panelists, if you will, for participating. And thank everyone for attending this evening. Hopefully you found the, the discussion very useful. Thank and you. thank our moderator, Kim. Yes. Thank you. And we have a little present for our panel on behalf of the Educational Leadership Program. We'd like to present those, if we may. A little gift bag that we have for you. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's always a good night when you go home with a present. <laughs> Thank you very much. Nice. The signed autographed pictures of Dr. Woman are in the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have one signed of you, too? We do. <laughs> <laughs> on the back of her picture. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Very nice. Do you still have a student at the school? Okay, you look really familiar to me. <laughs>